Okay, first and foremost, I must apologize for that disgustingly clickbait use of the term pirate shirt in the title, but honestly, would anyone have even clicked this video if I'd called it something as utterly mundane as making an 18th century men's shirt, and thus nobody would have the great honor of learning the actual history of this legendary puffy-sleeved so-called pirate shirt. Anyway, today I shall be making one of these said 18th century pirate shirts, and as is my method, I will be doing so as per the methods available to your average pirate in said 18th century. That is, entirely by hand, since sewing machines weren't exactly a thing that existed yet. A few disclaimers. One, these under items such as shirts, chemises, shifts, and smocks are actually really great beginner's projects since they're made up only of straight grain squares and rectangles, so to answer that question I'm asked all the time, this is actually a really great beginner's project since they're really only made up of straight grain squares and rectangles. I do have another video on my construction process of a woman's shift if you wish to see that instead, but for all you gentlemen who have waited so patiently for some examples of menswear sewing projects, or ladies who, like me, require some fabulous attire in which to romantically smash the patriarchy, or for our non-binary friends who cannot be bothered with such pedantic confines as strictly gendered clothing and just want to live their best poofy shirt life, basically pirate shirts for all. Furthermore, I should disclaim that while I personally prefer working according to historical practice, foregoing such modern conveniences as electric sewing machines, I do this purely because I find it fun and because I find that I learn more about the history through this practical application, but you can do what makes you happy. There are no rules in piracy, I'm pretty sure. So here's a little diagram of the pieces I'm cutting out, as well as how I got these measurements. Feel free to pause and screenshot if you wish, but otherwise I shan't bore you with these details. Again, shifts and shirts are comprised wholly of squares and rectangles sized according to your individual body measurements, so you don't even have to worry about buying patterns or scaling things up with this. I will be making the shirt out of this white linen. This is from Burnley and Trowbridge. This has been pre-washed. Pro tip, it is always a good idea to pre-wash your fabrics that you plan to wash as an actual worn garment. So materials like linen and cotton especially are washable fabrics and therefore make washable garments and therefore should be pre-washed. Things like silk and wool you don't throw in the washing machine, so I don't bother pre-washing those. So I'm starting off first by marking out the dimensions of all my squares and rectangles out on linen. I'm not fully tracing them out because, as you'll see, and I'm about to get real pedantic about this, but basically if you've worked with linen before, you know that it is super slippery and doesn't like to stay exactly straight. And one of the goals of working with straight square or rectangular shapes is to keep that crisscross of the fabric weave as straight up and down slash side to side as possible. This is hard to do with linen since it wants to slip around and be free, and if you're not careful you'll end up cutting it extremely off-grid which will make your shirt hang off in all sorts of weird directions that isn't straight up and down. Basically, you want to cut your piece as precisely along one thread of the fabric as humanly possible, which can be done in one of two ways. If you have supremely accurate eyesight, you can take a pair of scissors and carefully cut your pieces along one single thread, or, and this takes a bit more time but is slightly easier on the eyes, you can do what's called drawing threads, using a pin to carefully extract a length of the fabric thread so that you're left with a gap in the weave that you can then cut along to achieve a perfectly squared up shape. I'm also just cutting, I think this is a four or five inch slit at the center front of the body panel, which will be that front neck slit. Okay friends, so here we have two shirt body pieces. We have two sleeves, two cuffs, two collar pieces, two gussets. So now that we have all of our pieces nice and merrily cut out, we can go ahead and start stitching things together. Okay, so I have got my shirt body pieces now laid out like that. Okay, I should disclaim, you don't have to cut these pieces in two as I have done. You can just cut this the length of the fabric and leave this seam stitched together. Don't know why I didn't do that. But since I have this separation here, I now have to put these pieces back together. I'm actually going to take advantage of the situation by putting a really strong counter hem seam. Okay, I'm endeavoring to explain the stuff in this video, hopefully in ways that beginners can understand. So if you know what I'm talking about, like skip ahead or something. So a counter hem, I'm gonna need some hands for this. It is a hem where the edge is folded under here and the edge is folded under here, but basically the two edges of the seam are going to interlock like this. So the raw edges are going to be sort of encapsulated within each other. And because there's this double layer of material here, it creates a really strong double layer seam right there. It's not the most inconspicuous seam. It's very obvious. However, it's a nice 
strong seams. So I think that's what I'm going to do. In fact, a lot of these 18th century men's shirts actually have additional reinforcement strips around the shoulder, arms eye, front and back bit here, um, which I have elected not to do for this shirt, mostly out of laziness. So I'm just going to do a little counter hem seam uh, across the shoulder edges here, but of course not at the neckline area because this is going to stay free. There's quite a bit of excess room in here so that this gets gathered up to make all the glorious puff. I did end up pinning more of this seam than I actually stitched. It should really only be as long as the measurement from the base of your neck to the tip of your shoulder, plus about two to three inches since the shoulder seam of these shirts tend to slip a bit off the shoulder just naturally historically. So you'll be left with a lot of excess room for the neck hole area, which will get gathered up into the collar for poof purposes later. To stitch this all together, I'm going to be using some bleached linen thread, also from Burnley and Trowbridge, which is appropriately S-twisted two-ply thread that is similar to thread that would have been used historically, unlike the three-ply Z-twisted polyester thread that is often used today. Linen thread does need to be waxed for strength before use, so I'm running it along a block of beeswax to coat it before threading it through the needle. If you're working by electric machine, don't worry about the historically accurate two-ply linen thread since you won't be able to wax it, and it probably won't tolerate being rigged through a machine very well. The shoulder seam is then felled down on both the outside and inside with tiny felling stitches. And if you're unfamiliar with hand stitching techniques and need some more detailed demonstration, I do have two videos on those that will be of use, which I shall link down below and on this video if you need to take a quick diversion. Okay, so now for a slightly complex bit, this is where we put on the sleeve. The sleeve itself is not hugely complex for once, like in everyone's lives. Figuring out the arm side is going to be a challenge because it's individual to every person. I've cut a sort of standard from what I can gather here. The gussets seem to be very big. As you can see, this is the sleeve piece. The sleeve really only comes down, I want to say like two inches at most. The whole rest of the sleeve just like gathers up into the top shoulder area, but the whole rest of the arm side is basically just comprised of this gusset. The gussets on men's shirts for some reason tend to be a lot larger than the gussets on women's shirts. So I'm trying to mimic this large gusset situation and I think I've worked out, I mean this is, this looks roughly proportionally how much room should be at the top shoulder bit. So this sleeve piece will gather down into this. As you can see, there's more sleeve than there is room here. That's because it will get all those nice, lovely, pretty gathers up there. I have just cut these sort of standard, I think, what's it, six inch by six inch square gussets. Just, that was a guess. However, I think it's too big. So I'm not going to replicate that specifically. I'm going to try and adjust this to my size. You really don't want your arm size to be too big. Otherwise you're not going to have as much arm movement. So I'm gonna try and demonstrate this on myself. So you really don't want your arm size to be going really much lower than this because if your arm size all the way down here and you have fabric from here to here this is going to sort of pin your arms to your sides a lot more whereas if your fabric's up here you've got a lot more room to raise your arm if that makes any sense so the six inch by six inch including this proportional bit up here is going to run a bit too low and even so i think this is a bit too uh, wide for me. I may take this up about another inch. So what I will do is I will just, and I can do this just by taking a tape measure from the top of my shoulder to about where I want the arms I default to figure out this length here. Um, and then I will just go back to my thread drawing as I previously did, square that up and just cut off any excess. And then we shall start stitching everything on. Okay, actually I procrastinated starting on the sleeve gussets by preparing my collar and cuff pieces first instead. My two collar pieces are stitched around three of the outer edges with a small back stitch, leaving free the long edge that is to be attached to the shirt. For the cuffs, I'm taking my wide cuff shapes and folding them in half, then back stitching the two short edges together, once again leaving the edge that will be attached to the shirt free. The cuff and collar pieces are then turned right side out and pressed flat. Okay, we have sufficiently procrastinated and it is time to prepare the sleeves. I'm going to start by getting the gusset onto the sleeve and finishing off the entire sleeve before I attach it to the shirt. This is done by attaching one edge of the gusset square to one armpit section of the sleeve, then attaching the immediate next side of the square to the opposite edge of the sleeve like so. Then the rest of the open sleeve seam can be pinned shut. Then, starting from the top of one side of the gusset, I'm just backstitching my way down. When I reach the junction between the gusset and the rest of the sleeve seam, I'm making sure to pass cleanly from gusset to sleeve without pinning down the seam allowance on the opposite side of the gusset. This makes no sense when I try and explain this verbally, but I promise it'll make sense if you're actually trying to do this yourself. Now 
Once I've backstitched down the length of the seam, minus the last two to three inches where you'll need a little slit in the cuff to get your hand through, I then return to the top of the sleeve to backstitch the second side of the gusset. I should note that I'm choosing to backstitch all of these seams since backstitching is the strongest method of stitching a garment together. Yes, it takes about twice as long to backstitch a seam than to just running stitch it since basically every time you take a stitch forward, you also go a length backwards, but it's this back and forth directional pull of the thread that makes the seam so strong. There's a common misconception that all historical garments ever are all backstitched, but according to actual surviving garments, this actually isn't true. A lot of seams, especially long seams like skirt and dress seams that don't necessarily need to take a lot of strain, are just running stitched for speed rather than strength. I've chosen to backstitch the entire shirt though, since historically these garments were skin layers that needed to be washed regularly, and prior to the age of washing machines, the laundering process could be very harsh on clothing. Very often it's only the skin layers that are washed very regularly. So undergarments in particular, such as what the shirt would have been, needed to be very strong. Now, to finish off the raw edges to prevent these seams from fraying, I'm going to fell them into place. I need to be strategic about which side I fold over to do this so that I can be sure that my gusset junction is properly finished. All the seams on this gusset and sleeve need to fold over the same side, so I'm just trimming all my left-hand side seams down to about an eighth of an inch. Just a warning though, I do my felled seams super tiny. I've had lots and lots of practice and know exactly how narrow I am capable of folding my seams, but if you are new to sewing, you may wish to work with more seam allowance. Stitch about half an inch from the edge instead, then trim your seam down to a quarter of an inch so that you have a bit more room for folding. It's up to you. Starting with the gusset side that will underlap the sleeve seam, I'm folding the wider edge of the seam allowance over the trimmed edge, then felling this into place with small felling stitches. It's super important to be sure that you're pressing the seam down super flat from both the top and the underside as you stitch, so that you don't end up with a bubbling excess of fabric on the underside, which is actually the outside of your garment, which you do not want. Then I can go ahead and fell down the longer sleeve seam, which feeds into that second half of the gusset seam, and end up with one nice, clean, finished gusset seam. The next step, well, after I've hemmed those free cuff slit edges separately, is to add a little reinforcement at the split where there's that natural point of weakness. This is done by taking a small one inch square, folding under about one eighth of an inch all around, and then felling it to the shirt all around. I'll do one of these patches on either side, inside and outside in the same position, so that any pulling strain is absorbed by the patch instead of the weak point in the seam junction. Now, since a pirate shirt is not official without poofy sleeves, we must install said poof. I'm doing this by running a gathering thread all around the bottom cuff edge of the sleeve piece, as well as across the upper sleeve edge, but not along the gusset edges. Remember, we want that top sleeve portion to scrunch down into that four to six inch space at the top of the shoulder while the gusset remains flat. The gathering thread is done just with a simple running stitch and unwaxed thread, since it'll be easier to slide if it isn't coated. And as this isn't permanent, it doesn't need to be particularly durable. Then matching the center of the cuff piece to the center of the ungathered sleeve piece and pinning the edges of the sleeve to the edges of one side of the cuff, I can then go ahead and gather the sleeve down into neat folds by pulling on the loose gathering thread. This gathering bit is then stitched to the cuff with, you guessed it, some more backstitching. Then the other side of the cuff, which was left free, is folded over the raw edges of the previous side and felled into place. And now that we have two complete sleeves, it's time to prepare the actual body of the shirt. Disregarding the bits at the armhole that I've marked out for setting in the sleeves, I'm proceeding down the remaining length of the body pieces, pinning them together at the sides. 
these side seams are, once again, backstitched into place. I'm passing about every two to three threads in the fabric weave with each stitch here, which to be honest is actually probably more in line with fine 19th century schoolgirl precision sewing than the more, shall we say, get it done, time is money stitching that is often seen in the 18th century. So yeah, tiny stitching is also in a huge part a result of the size needle that you use. It's really difficult, even for the highly practiced hand sewer, to get really, really fine stitches with a needle that's too long or thick. So I prefer to use these tiny number 10 sharps, which allow me to get really small, neat stitches. Anyway, once those seams are backstitched, I'm going to get the sleeves in before finishing the seams. While the garment is inside out, I'm inserting the right side out sleeve into the armhole, pinning the gusset bit into place, then gathering the sleeve portion into the rest of the space, just as I did with the cuff ends. And whilst we backstitch, trim, and fell down those seams in exactly the same method we used previously for the sleeve and gusset operation, I think now is a marvelous opportunity to take this moment to tell you about our sponsor for today's video, Skillshare. Unless you are stumbling into this weird part of YouTube at 3am and are deeply pondering what sequence of life events occurred to warrant you sitting here watching a 20 minute video on historically accurate pirate shirts, which like, fair, you've probably heard me talk about Skillshare before because not only am I honored that they seem to enjoy sponsoring my sewing projects, but they also happen to be a service I use regularly in my own everyday life. Skillshare is an online learning platform focused on helping people build creative and business skills with thousands of courses in all sorts of topics ranging from fine art to photography, video production to marketing, business management, and productivity. I've actually taken to blocking out some time each week to watch through a course or two because I am such a firm believer in the importance of continual learning and improvement. And this week, well, this week that I'm presently writing the script, I had the joy of taking Tabitha Park's course on Lightroom Classic, a total beginner walkthrough, because while I'm quite pleased with the improvement in my Photoshop skills I've built over the last two years, Lightroom is a software I still have yet to touch, and I am so ready to level up my photography game for an Instagram page full of dreamy hand sewing close-ups. Skillshare is giving away two free months of premium membership to the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description box below to help you explore your creativity. After that, it's only around $10 a month. Oh, and I've also done the same thing at the bottom edge of this seam, by the way, where I've left the bottom approximate eight inches slit free, each side of which I'm heading down separately, just to allow for a bit of movement at the bottom of the shirt, since these are historically quite long, about mid-thigh length, and you do need a bit of freedom of movement down there. And where there is a slit, there is a weak point in the seam, which means we need another reinforcement patch here on both the inside and the outside. The end is nigh, friends. This next slit just needs a quick hem. The slit I've cut here is, I think, around five or six inches, which is just barely enough to allow the shirt to slip on over my head. Historically, the men's shirt slits look to be around 10 inches long, but I do intend to wear this as an everyday outerwear shirt, and I will require a bit more coverage, but you may do as you please. all around the unfinished collar edges at the front and back, but just not over the shoulder areas, I'm running another set of gathering threads that will allow me to gather up all the excess neck room into the collar, which is attached exactly as the cuffs were, only this time I'm marking on the collar where the center back is, as well as where the shoulder seams should be, so that I have those reference points to line up on the actual shirt. Okay, actually, finally this time, I'm going to put two buttons onto each cuff to close them. These are just small shell buttons that I had in my stash, but wood, bone, or thread buttons are equally historically accurate. The buttonholes are done by hand using thick silk buttonhole twist, and once again, I do have a separate video going into all the details on this stitch if you so require. and the bottom edge of the shirt is given a quick hem as usual.
and Project Epic Pirate Shirt slash Mr. Darcy Core Aesthetic Trash Shirt is complete. My time span for working on this project IRL was split around another project, but consecutively I want to say that this probably took about a week to a week and a half to complete. And this was with hand sewing the entire thing. I imagine one could get this done in a day or two by machine, but then again, I wouldn't know. This is a garment I undoubtedly have plans to wear pretty much all day, every day, that is, until I realize that it's made out of linen and the nightmare of ironing I'm about to face every time I wash it is going to be a time. But you know what? It is supremely worth for the level of purely distilled romantic period drama slash epic pirate adventure vibes I will get to partake in whilst going about the usual everyday mundanities. Here's to a bit of adventure in these times of plague, my friend.